the people that are involved in this, in addition to me, are really exceptional people, and I've learned a lot just by interacting with them. And I'm looking for ways to give back and to contribute. And I'm really passionate about myelopathy.org because of the passion that it incites. Hello and welcome to Malopathy Matters, the official podcast of the charity Malopathy.org. Where we talk all things degenerative cervical myelopathy from the perspective of the professionals, the researchers and the people living with myelopathy. I'm Ewan Sadler, a person with DCM and a founder of Malopathy.org. I'm Ben Davies, neurosurgeon scientist and also a founder of Myelopathy.org. This is Malopathy Matters. So as we kick off 2023, we are hearing the latest from Myelopathy.org's task forces, groups of different healthcare professionals and people living with DCM from around the world advancing key research priorities. So far, we have heard from Dr. Arya Nuri on laying the foundations for unlocking the onset of DCM, and Dr. Lindsay Tetro on creating diagnostic criteria. This month, we focus on what care other than surgery should entail, the focus of our perioperative incubator. I think this is so important. From talking to people in the Sabo group, nothing seems to exist at the moment. This was very much my experience as well. We are left to our own devices, and that's not good at all. And we should reflect on that experience, you, and all of those experiences, really, because it's something that has completely shaped my approach to DCM since we first met, and an experience we had the opportunity to share together at the recent UK Brit Spine Conference. Uh, you kindly put together a very powerful video, which is available on YouTube, but um, we'll play play now. Hi, I'm Ewan Sadler, a person living with DCM and co-founder of Malopathy.org. My journey with myelopathy began in my 30s with muscle aches and neck stiffness. I was a busy married father running a sign and design business and training regularly in jiu-jitsu. I just assumed I was getting older. Unfortunately for me and many others, discovering the name and the seriousness of my condition took many years. Alone and unsupported, I had to navigate a maze of doctor's appointments, seeking answers that seemed totally out of reach. Meanwhile, I kept on pushing my body through the physical demands of my job and my active lifestyle, unaware that it was only making things a lot worse. The unbearable muscle spasms and pain were a constant battle. My body was sending distress signals, but no one knew the cause. I struggled through 14 years of doctor's visits and numerous trips to A&E before someone finally linked the problems to my neck. This felt like a relief, finally an answer, and with surgery surely a solution. I was totally unprepared for what would follow I underwent surgery and had an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion from C4 to C7. I was discharged home after only two days, barely able to swallow. I ate only Weetabix for three months with no rehabilitation or advice on what to do or what to avoid. And at my single follow-up appointment, the surgeon considered the operation a success. But I had gone from an able-bodied, active, middle-aged and married man to a divorced, unemployed and disabled one. My independence and purpose had been taken from me. I was only 44. Getting stuck in the bath and needing to call my mother to help me out was a new low. Some of the problems I would eventually learn to live with. I could walk with a stick and I could use my computer again. But many other problems my doctors were unwilling to acknowledge. The chronic pain. 
the unexplained muscle twitches and spasms and the fatigue. This didn't help at home. The doctors say the operation was a success, Ewan. Why can't you get back to work? My now ex-wife would say. Hitting rock bottom motivated me to find a new path. It led me to start an online peer-to-peer -peer support group, which would become malopathy.org. Here, I found thousands of other people in the same position asking the same questions. Should I have surgery and what can I expect from it? Why do I feel like this despite having surgery? Does it mean it's happening again? Are there any treatments or lifestyle changes that can help? How can I access financial support or why has it been declined? Why has my doctor never heard of this condition? Living with myelopathy is a mystery to healthcare professionals and this needs to change. I remember a charity member telling me she had been dismissed from a spinal cord injury community as a walker. Perhaps we look different, but we face similar problems. Aftercare and support are readily available for people with traumatic spinal cord injuries. Don't people realise that myelopathy is also a form of spinal cord injury and way more common? Myelopathy causes lifelong and hidden disabilities. Through trial and error, I found some strategies that help. Meditation and mindfulness, for example. This tells me there are some simple gains to be made by recognising this as a lifelong condition. I urge you all to raise awareness and improve care pathways for myelopathy. Thank you. How was it, you and putting that together, all those memories resurfacing? I must admit, it resurfaced a few raw memories doing this. And again, I was in two minds whether I should share a more in-depth viewpoint of my myelopathy journey. But if my story can be sort of catalyst for change, then it's done its job. I really don't want anyone to go through what I had to endure. It's really humbling to hear. And it, and it certainly struck a chord when we played it at the conference. This is the Brit Spine 2023 was in Glasgow uh, last month. A chord that it struck with many, many others around the world, including those in the perioperative incubator. I mean, surgery is an important therapy, but there are so many additional challenges that we aren't addressing. And we hear that from your story there, education, pain, nutrition. So these are things that we need to work on. It's time to hear about the progress our task force is making from the group's chair, Chad Cook. Professor of Physical Therapy from Duke University. Asking the questions again is Liz Roberts, our RICO DCM Project Manager. Hi, Chad. Um, could you start off by telling us, please, what is the Perioperative Rehabilitation Incubator? And broadly, who is involved in this incubator? The DCM Perioperative Rehab Incubator, I think the best way to think about it is it's a think tank of healthcare professionals and individuals with lived experience with degenerative cervical myelopathy or DCM. And we're interested in improving knowledge and action regarding perioperative care for DCM. And, and when I talk about perioperative care, I'm describing the care before, during, and after the surgery. Surgery is actually one of the most common treatments for moderate to severe DCM. But despite that, we really don't have definitive guidelines on how to perform best practice for patients who receive the surgery. The perioperative incubator is actually an extension of myelopathy.org, which is a charitable group. And these are individuals that volunteer their efforts to improve overall care and knowledge about DCM. In our perioperative rehab incubator, we have a number of individuals. We have neurosurgeons, physical medicine and rehabilitative physicians. We have nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists. We have several researchers who actually specialize in DCM research. And I think what's unique about this group is that we also have people with lived experience with DCM who can provide their perspectives of the care that they received and, and help really reshape how we're, we're doing this. I'm 
a physical therapist or a physiotherapist by training. I also am a DCM researcher. I think it's exciting to be part of this group. So what's your motivation then for being part of this incubator? What do you see as its role and opportunity? Well, I mentioned I'm a researcher and I've actually been involved with DCM research since 2008. And I remember some of the earlier works that I did that really informed a large portion of the rehab-based population because there was just nothing out there. And despite the fact that surgery is the most common option for moderate to severe DCM, there really hasn't been a lot that has changed with respect to research since 2008. We do have some narratives that are out. We have some uh, cohort-related work that's out. We do have some work that talk about outcomes with respect to surgery. But what we lack is kind of a blueprint or guide rails on how to best manage individuals outside the surgical context. So I was excited to be able to address that piece because that's the type as a clinician that I would manage. That's the type as a researcher that I'm most interested in. In other words, what does that experience around surgery look like? What should it look like? What's best practice management? And I think the other reason I'm motivated to be involved is the people that are involved in this, in addition to me, are really exceptional people. And I've learned a lot just by interacting with them. But secondly, I'm near the tail end of my career and I'm looking for ways to give back and to contribute. And I'm really passionate about myelopathy.org because of the passion that it incites in people. And I'm excited to do something for the right reason. Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. And that's been my experience as well. There's been so much motivation, hasn't there, since you um, came on board to chair this incubator. Let's go into a little bit more deeply then. What are we currently working towards? Can you give us an overview of how we're approaching the problem? Sure. When the group met, we decided that there was so much information and that those timeframes around surgery, pre, peri, and post-operative management were so different that we really needed three different sets of guidelines three different recommendations for each of those periods. So what we've done is we've broken it down into different buckets or domains, and we hope to cover overall general health management because obviously you want to improve the health of the individual overall, treatment parameters for physical and occupational therapy since they're integral at this phase or these phases, education on disease trajectory, complications, potentially a core information set for patient decision-making aids, and then setting up expectations for those patients. Folks with lived experience have mentioned that they it was often a black box. They didn't know quite what to expect. Recovery and discharge planning. Pain management is another area that we are building parameters around. Quality of life management. Surgical planning and expectations as well. So our goal is to create something similar to a clinical practice guidelines. We'll probably call it best practice or best management guidelines because it's lacking enough detail, I think, to be considered a true clinical practice guideline. And we hope to publish the work, hopefully in an open access journal that's not firewalled so that all clinicians, all patients, all policymakers will have access to this work. And it can help, especially those individuals who are not familiar with day-to-day management of DCM, for perioperative care, it will help those individuals, I think, the most. Why is this so important and how will it translate into clinical care? Well, I mentioned that clinical practice guidelines are typically the blueprint that people follow when managing care. So a rotator cuff related disorder, there are heaps of clinical practice guidelines. Low back pain, I know there are probably 39 international guidelines for management of low back pain. Right now, there are zero practice guidelines for surgical management for patients with DCM. And typically, to create a clinical practice guideline, you do a consensus development panel or, or some other process. It, it tends to be lengthy. It's anywhere from six months to a year. What people typically do is they pull systematic reviews, randomized controlled trials, cohort studies, data that are out there that suggests that there's a higher fidelity of a type of care management. Unfortunately, We really don't have a lot of that information. As I mentioned, there's not a lot of information around DCM on best management for perioperative care. And when little data are available, typically you look for expert opinion. So our goal to improve our ability on this 
which we think is really important is, is we've gone to the sources and we've actually identified those individuals that are involved in care and we've asked them to outline best practice management. We feel that it's a perfect first step in building this foundation on what best care looks like. And then hopefully researchers can follow up on this, maybe test what we put together. We think it'll translate to clinical care because quite frankly, there's nothing right now. It's going to give a very nice foundation for people to provide best perioperative care. Can you tell us what's been achieved so far then? That sounds like a lot to manage. How is it all going? Probably the biggest thing that we've done that is still an ongoing process is we've created a working group. These are amazing people from all over the world who have essentially identified what we were doing and they've asked to be involved. So our initial working group has expanded probably to double the size. We have people, like I said, from all over the world with a number of different professional backgrounds, but also different interests in the different domains of care. People who have specialties in nursing, people who have specialties in rehab, we have people with specialties in maybe medication management. And that was purposeful. We really needed that working group to help build that piece up. We have initiated two papers so far, that's the preoperative and perioperative management. And we've started to write those papers. And, and I would argue we're a third to halfway through these two papers. There's a third paper, postoperative management, that is being written but has not been released to the working group yet. We're hoping to get a little bit more momentum on the first two papers. People have signed up for different areas, different domains in which they'll be writing best practice management aspects in those areas. I would see the first paper probably being completed in June of 2023, subsequent papers after that. As I mentioned, these consensus-based projects typically take about six months to a year. So it is something that has to brew a little bit because everybody provides input. We do have a really wonderful opportunity also to speak about our efforts, which I think will get us in front of a larger audience. And an upcoming international conference in Glasgow called Brit Spine will actually be talking about our perioperative incubator and what we're doing and the papers we're writing. I would guess that we'll probably get individuals that are interested in being involved at that point too. What do you think are the critical challenges then for this incubator and, and how can we overcome those? Yeah, I think it's easy when you, you're on a clinical practice guideline and you have a lot of data to work with and it's easy to refine that data and to make suggestions from that. We don't have that. So that that's certainly part of it. We're, we're starting from scratch and we're taking expert opinion and we're quantifying it. So that's probably the first one. I think the second major challenge is that everybody involved with the incubator and myelopathy.org, it's a volunteer effort. So you're taking exceptional people, incredibly busy because they're exceptional, and you're adding more work upon them. So you're relying on good faith and people contributing their time. It's difficult to get everybody to contribute their time when their time is already maxed out. I think the last one is the nature of what we're doing is consensus-based research. And consensus-based research, it allows for input from everyone that's involved in the project. Their thoughts are weighed carefully and equally, and we end up getting a consensus-based decision in which it may not be unanimous, not everybody agrees on it, but we're all swimming in a similar direction. And those are not easy things to do. And I've been involved in over 10 consensus-based research projects. And certainly one of the things I've learned from my involvement, we need to be patient. Let this marinate so that the final product really reflects what we want it to be, which in truth, I do think will be best practice guidelines for this. We will meet live a few more times. I think the meeting live piece reignites everyone's interest in the project. It puts us on the same page, gets us going in the same direction. That'll help out. But I think time's going to be helpful. And I think seeing examples of what other people write will be a positive thing as well. You said that um, progress in DCM has been slow historically. Why do you think that is? Is DCM sort of unpopular disease for some reason? And um, I think I remember you saying on social media, for example, posts on DCM don't get as many shares as acute spinal cord injury posts. Why do you think that is? Well, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it is kind of a silent disease. I know that it's difficult to discriminate the condition from other competing conditions especially in the elderly population, because a lot of the early signs and symptoms overlap a lot with just general aging-related symptoms. It is the most 
common spinal cord injury in individuals over the age of 55. So I think part of it is we miss it. I think I had once said that you may not have seen myelopathy in clinical practice, but it has seen you. And it's likely that there are several individuals with mild cases of myelopathy that we treat, and we just miss them. I think it's difficult in good faith, ethically, to do a clinical trial for patients who have moderate to severe DCM. Uh, I, I would have hesitation in having a control group that does not receive surgery being one that has looked at the backside of these, of individuals who do receive surgery, the outcomes are pretty good. So I don't think you can really build that piece of it. It's not very fundable, unfortunately. It's, it's not as glamorous as some of the conditions. You don't see RFAs from grant agencies that will support research in DCM. You know, the correct answer to your question is, for me is I'm not sure why. It just hasn't had the popularity of other disease processes but I do know it's important, and I know it can absolutely change a person's quality of life if their care is provided in the right way. So even if it's not that glamorous or not that visible, it's certainly worth addressing. Well, Ian, what did you think about that? Chad's been such an outstanding addition to the team and you know, really humbled that he thinks that we're an inspiring organization. Yeah, what a great interview. And I'm so pleased that Chad has joined the team. He seems to have given this problem incredible direction. And he highlighted a very important factor is that there is a lack of emotional support for myelopathy. It isn't just a physical challenging condition, but it's also very challenging mentally as well. You're absolutely right, Ewan. And I think that's one of the key unknowns at the moment. We can see in all of the data at a very high level that there's this huge burden of emotional and mental uh, loss of quality of life in, in myelopathy. And we haven't really been able to identify why that is. But ultimately, until we ask the right questions and probe into it, then, then we're never going to know. We'll never be able to offer the right support. For me, of all of the research priorities, I thought this one had the most immediate opportunity to change care. You know, on the face of it, it seemed really simple. We could just take things that we do from other conditions and apply them to DCM. But in reality, it's been a really difficult area to get off the ground. And I think that's probably because, you know, the size of the opportunity, um, probably what the solution needs to be. You know, this isn't going to be a, a simple magic bullet where one thing fixes it for everybody. It's probably about doing 100 things 1% better. And, and that may be very individualized as well. So that really means we need to bring a lot of different people together. You know, it's not just about physical therapy here. It's the education. It's the psychology that you mentioned. It's about pain care. And and that's a big effort. It's a difficult one. And, and I think Chad's brought, as you say, great direction to this problem. Yes, definitely. And as you say, Ben, thinking differently, but working together. And by working together, we can get a better understanding of DCM. Absolutely. I think it's becoming the motto for, for Recode DCM uh, and it's something that we really hope to build on. So what's up next month? Well, next month we're joined by Professor Aya Sharma, a surgeon scientist from India, who has completed a randomized controlled trial with an injectable therapy called cerebralisin. Look out for that one. So all that remains to be said is a big thanks to Chad Cook for joining us this month. Myelopathy Matters is produced by Carl Homer from Cambridge TV and is the podcast of myelopathy.org. Keep up to date with the latest in the field of degenerative cervical myelopathy. Make sure you're subscribed on your favorite podcast app. Or you can also sign up on the website to our newsletter, where there's also lots more information about the condition, about support, and about research going on around the world. If you'd like to get involved, get in touch with the project manager via recode at myelopathy.org. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.